coming up. It's the story of a rock band whose sound was a unique mixture of modern rock and unique folk elements. Uh, after catching a big break touring with the huge American rock act, they actually had bottles thrown at them, some filled with urine. But they persevered, and their debut album it would sell over 2 million copies, and it produced one of the most timeless singles of the entire 80s. Only their lead singer, who wrote the song, he didn't think it was any good. It took some serious convincing and an overhaul of the song to actually change his mind. But after that, it became their biggest hit in the U.S. and also their only hit that most Americans remember. But was this band really a one-hit wonder? Or is there more to this story? You're going to find out coming up next, one of the best songs of the 80s on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember jumping on the trampoline with the sprinkler underneath it, or the old do-it-yourself water slides that we used to make, sometimes out of garbage sacks, you're gonna dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Promise you're gonna find something you'll like on this channel. We also have a Patreon. An additional library of content resides there, including a new improv show I'm going to start doing. And when you join, you can become an honorary producer to help us curate this music. We also have our merch below. Both of these things help the channel to go. So it's time for another edition of one of my favorite uh, series we do on here, Bottle Lightning. This is where we celebrate a song or an album that was king for a day or many days. Here we honor artists and bands that rocketed up the charts, but for reasons mostly unknown, weren't able to sustain that success, we try to find out the unknown. Uh, called by some as one-hit wonders, we celebrate them instead as lightning in a bottle. Previous episodes, we've covered 8675309 Jenny by Tommy Two-Tone, A Dare Commissar by After the Fire, and Don't Forget Me When I'm Gone by Glass Tiger. Today, we're going big with one that's been requested for quite some time by a lot of you out there. Great song if there ever was one. Scottish slash English rockers, Big Country, and their 1983 signature hit, In a Big Country. Oh, what a feel-good song. A native of Dunfermline, Scotland, a big country Stuart Adamson was schooled in Scottish folk music while growing up. The lead singer remember Friday and Saturday nights after the pubs had closed up, say, uh, actually... His exact quote, there would always be folks around, guys up there playing guitars, bagpipes, accordions, and fiddles. So some of the things I write, they go right back to then. Stuart, he started writing songs when he was about 12 years old. And by the time he was 18, this was in about 77, he founded a punk band called The Skits. The group was prolific, releasing four albums, two EPs, and nine charting singles between 1978 and 1981. Their most successful track was Into the Valley that reached number 10 on the UK singles chart. Into the valley, into the However, by 1981, Adamson was ready to redirect his energy into a new project, Big Country. Taking up lead vocals and guitar, Stewart was joined by guitarist Bruce Watson. Other early members of the band included Pete Wishart on keyboards, Alan Wishart on bass, and Clive Parker on drums. Together, Adamson and Watson developed a distinctive twin guitar sound and actually took big country on the road to support one Alice Cooper. <laughs> but Watson later called it a big, big mistake. You remember that Cooper's crowds threw bottles of piss at them, among other things. Sonically, it just wasn't a good match, as you can imagine. So Big Country pulled off of the tour. More than a little disappointed with the hostile response the group disbanded from there, and Stuart and Bruce, they returned to the drawing board. But as luck would have it, Phonogram A&R man Chris Briggs invited Stuart and Bruce to record some demos in London. Briggs, who had worked with bands like Def Leppard and Dire Straits, he knew of Adamson from his days with the punk band The Skids, and he felt like there was a lot of potential there. Chris connected the duo with drummer Mark Brzezicki and bassist Tony Butler, who at the time were, were basically just a rhythm section for hire. Together, this foursome, they reformed Big Country, and they created a dynamic sound that really drew from you know, modern rock and traditional Scottish folk music including a twin lead guitar sound that at times mimicked bagpipes. So cool. So in 
Some critics would group them in a loose regional genre with, you know, the alarm and U2. Others peg them as new wave. But, you know, Stuart Adamson, he set the record straight telling us everything that they weren't. Big country is not punk, new wave, heavy metal, progressive, or pop. What they were was big country, a band with a sound that was all their own, said what they felt like. The band's debut album, The Crossing, that was produced by the up-and-comer Steve Lillywhite, who had his own connection to U2. Uh, of course, a top producer in the business. Lily Wade had already found success producing for Peter Gabriel, Psychedelic Fur, Susie and the Banshees, and of course, U2. In fact, Lily Wade was the man behind U2's first three albums and had just finished recording their breakthrough war before joining up with Big Country. And the pairing, it was, how do you say it, positively explosive. The music of The Crossing, it was grand, it was inspirational, it was modern rock while at the same time sounding like it came from the far distant past. On the notes in the CD reissue of The Crossing, Adamson described it exactly this way. The music I felt wasn't like the music I had grown up hearing, or rather not like any one of them. It was all of them jumbled up and drawn into something I could understand as mine. The sound made pictures, spread out wide landscapes. Great dramas were played out under turbulent skies. There was romance and reality, truth and dare, people being people, no heroes, just you and me. I love that. Always loved it since I read it. The album would be recorded over the course of five weeks uh, between May and June of 1983 at the Manor Studios in Oxfordshire and at Rack in London. When it was complete, Adamson and the rest of the band, they were thrilled with exactly how it sounded. They gave Lily White high praise, saying that you know, he hadn't set out to create a, a Steve Lily White record. He didn't have a set producer sound. Rather, he was all about bringing out the best of big country sound. You know, what I'm talking about, like Mutt Lang kind of has his own sound, but this was all big country. Released in July 1983, The Crossing would sell more than 2 million copies worldwide. The album reached number three in the UK, where it spent an impressive 80 weeks on the charts. You know, rubbed shoulders with the likes of Michael Jackson's Thriller, David Bowie's Let's Dance, and U2's War. It also hit number four in Canada and number 18 on the US Billboard 200 album chart. The Crossing, it issued four singles. Harvest Home, Fields of Fire, Chance, and of course today's feature in a big country. Now, as we get into this, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always wear. So here's the deal. Uh, ordering glasses, it can be a pain. Most of the time, the stores don't have what we want. That's why Zenny is perfect. You have so much variety that you can shop at your convenience as well. Design your own pair for the best prices out there, up to 80% off of regular retail prices. Make sure to click on the info button, our info button right up here. Click on our link below for the best deal out there. Design yours today. So from its opening notes, In a Big Country just explodes with vitality. The Celtic guitar elements create a distinct bagpipe-like resonance. <laughs> while Adamson passionately exclaims, Sha! Sha! And it you know, encourages us to persevere and stay alive. Audiences around the world would be enthralled by the song's unique sound and positive messages encapsulated by its anthemic chorus. In a big country, dreams stay with you. Like a lover's voice fires the mountainside, stay alive. Stay alive. But hard as it may be to believe today, Stuart Adamson was originally unsure if the song was any good at all. Written at the home of the band's long-term roadie, Les King, it took the long way around to reach completion, including a change of name altogether. Initially, the track was actually called Stay Alive. Sandra Adamson, who was Stuart's wife at the time, she remembered him phoning her at home and saying, I think I've written a good song, but I wasn't so sure when I first heard it. 
Just weeks before the song's release, which predated the album, Adamson also called his agent, John Giddings, to discuss some reservations that he had about the song. And during this call, John suggested changing the title from Stay Alive to In a Big Country. But if Adamson wasn't completely sold on the potential of this song, there was one person who just never doubted, Steve Lillywhite. Reportedly, Steve Lillywhite cried when he first heard this demo. He never gave up on it, spearheading some dramatic changes to the track when his fate was still uncertain. Uh, you can get a sense of this by comparing the finished version of In a Big Country to its actual demo. Let's take a look. Some of these changes included delaying the chorus until after the second verse, you know, adding the song's iconic bagpipe guitar break, and then having Stewart sing the bridge in a higher octave. According to drummer Mark Brzezicki, the changes they made to the track did the trick for Adamson. He said, listening back to the track once we'd finished recording, I'll never forget Stuart telling us, I think we got a hit here. And of course he was right. Describing what the song was all about, Stuart said the lyrics all came down to hope, you know, about having a sense of self in times of trouble highly metaphorical, the song is outright optimistic and it gives you this exhilarating feeling of open space. Steve Lillywhite, for his part, called it timeless. He also said, a lot of records don't date very well, but In a Big Country is one of those rare instances where the spirit and the quality of what's been recorded transcends the years. It's not hard to see why this track has become Big Country's signature tune, one of the best of the 80s. The music video for In a Big Country, that was huge on MTV directed by Lindsay Clonell. It is an adventure piece you know, in the spirit of Duran Duran's Hungry Like the Wolf. In it, we follow the four band members as they go on a treasure hunt across land and sea. Throughout the video, they have to match wits with a rival treasure seeker, a woman who seems to get the drop on them at almost every turn. In the end, they one-up her, but then rescue her from a deserted beach. Interspersed throughout the whole video are live performance shots of the band. It's all just such a, a great, exhilarating ride only the 80s can provide. In a Big Country, it was released on May 20th of 1983, five days before they started recording the album, actually. It went to number 17 in the Billboard Hot 100. It also reached number three on the U.S. Top Rocks chart. Internationally, In a Big Country went to number 34 in New Zealand, number 22 in Ireland, number 17 in the United Kingdom, number seven in Australia, and it scored a number three ranking in Canada. The song has also had several media placements to its credit, including Beavis and Butthead. This is like a James Bond movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Gilmore Girls, The Carey Diaries, The Goldbergs. Well, if we do this, we do it right. Casual, Peter Rabbit, Dom Hemingway, Air, and The Office. Really good sense of humor. Brother? Mm hmm. He never gets any of my jokes. As far as covers go, SR71 did it in 2000, Dashboard Confessional did it in 2006. Matt Nathanson did it in 2008, and American Authors released a version in 2014. Also, the Alarms lead singer Mike Peters, who we've had on the show before, he's covered it as well. 2012, he chose In a Big Country for a TV documentary series called The Song That Changed My Life. Uh, I guess Mike was inspired by the song during the alarm's early years and later on during his fight with cancer. In a big country, to stay with you like a also, as an aside, how many bands can you think of who've used their name in a title of one of their own songs? I was kind of thinking about this as I was putting this piece together. Um, it happens more than you might think. Uh, 
A few examples that come to mind, of course, the monkeys, right? Bad Company, Queen, Black Sabbath, Prince, Iron Maiden's done it, Motorhead. The list is actually pretty long and surprising, even longer when you add in bands who use their names in the lyrics of one of their songs. Looking at you, Wing Chun. So even though in the US many think of big country as being a one-hit wonder, there's so much more than that. Big Country did dish out a couple more US hits just on other charts. In 1986, Look Away landed at number five on the mainstream rock chart. That's a really good song. And then there's King of Emotion. That went to number 11 on the alternative chart in uh, 1988. But really, where Big Country made their mark was really internationally particularly in the UK and in Ireland. In the UK, they scored 14 top 40 hits in the 80s and 90s, four of which reached the top 10. Additionally, they had four top 10 albums as well, including 1984's number one, Still Town. Overall, Big Country has released nine studio albums and a couple of EPs. And while The Crossing was far and away their highest charter, Three others reached the Billboard 200 as well. This band had a, a long and prolific career for sure, although it would have its ups and downs. You know, by the time the 90s hit, Big Country started to lose commercial momentum. They were dropped by their label Phonogram after 1991's No Place Like Home. And then each album they released after that you know, seemed to be less popular than the previous. Stuart Adamson, he was also fighting depression and alcoholism. Uh, by 1996, alcohol was taking over his life. Sadly, this led to a divorce from his first wife, Sandra. Afterwards, he moved to Nashville, where he actually collaborated with country singer-songwriter Marcus Humman. Together, they released an alt-country record as the Raphaels in 2001. We will learn to roll. But before that, Stewart reconnected with Big Country for what would be his eighth and final studio album with the band, A Driving to Damascus. In the U.S., it was released under a different name, John Wayne's Dream. Uh, this was in 1999, if uh, memory serves. Although Adamson was really pleased with the record, he was really disappointed that it didn't fare better on the charts. It reached number 82 in the U.K., and it really was a no-show in the U.S. <laughs> Coping with mental illness and alcoholism, uh, Stuart Adamson completely disappeared off the grid later that year. He remained incognito for a while, but eventually he resurfaced, said that he just needed you know, some time off. The following year, the band embarked on what they billed as uh, their farewell tour. And then, be with me again, one to the and then on November 26, 2001, Adamson went missing again after having some marital struggles with his second wife, Melanie. Once again, alcohol was the factor. At the time, the couple had been estranged for several weeks, and Melanie filed for divorce the day that he disappeared. Adamson, uh, he would be gone for almost a full month, leaving you know, friends and family imagining the worst. Tragically, the worst is what happened. December 16th of 2001, Adamson was found dead in a hotel room in Honolulu, Hawaii. According to a local police report, Stewart had hung himself. An autopsy also revealed that he had consumed large quantities of alcohol shortly before his death. Um, a tribute to Stuart Adamson was held at Glasgow uh, Barrowlands in May 2002. It did feature the remaining members of Big Country, along with special guest vocalists, including The Alarms Mike Peters. The remaining three band members, Tony Butler, Mark Brzezicki, and Bruce Watson, had no intention of reforming Big Country ever again. Five years later, in 2007, they reunited once to celebrate the band's 25th anniversary. Said Watson, it wasn't a comeback. It was just the three of us having fun as friends and as a band and hoping to give the fans you know, some enjoyment by playing our songs live to celebrate 25 years together. Then in 2010, Bruce Watson asked Mike Peters to sing with Big Country officially. Mike agreed. 
band got back together. In April 2013, Big Country released The Journey and toured around the world to support the album. However, in 2014, Mike Peters left to you know, focus on The Alarm. Big Country is then joined by Simon Huff on vocals. He's front of the band into the 2020s. This was definitely one of those uh, big, sprawling 80s anthems that punched you in the face on the very first listen. It was so empowering. For me, it grabbed me by the throat as a kid growing up in a small town in Idaho. It grabbed me by the throat and it showed me that there was this great, big, huge world outside the confines of the small community that I was in. It made me dream big. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the town I grew up in, I still do, but this song was all about you know, pointing me toward what was possible, beyond my own vision. It's a melody that just takes you away. It lifts you up beyond fantasy. It's just a perfect song. It does exactly as it says. A song that helps you live and breathe and see the sun in the wintertime. And after one of the longest, coldest winters in my country's history, that's a true miracle. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Big Country and this amazing song, In a Big Country. What are your memories of it? What did you think about the first time that you heard it? Do you remember? What are your thoughts on the band? Let's have a great discussion below. What other songs should we cover from the 80s? Um, let us know. Let's have a great discussion. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the